Heavenly Father, as we come together to share this particular study, we ask that your Holy Spirit would guide and direct, that the information that we put forth would be for your honor and glory, that it would be easy to understand, that it would be honest and correct. And we thank you for bringing us to this point in earth's history and allowing us to participate in the work of finishing up here, the work here on planet earth that we might go home and be done with this world of sin. And we ask that you would uh, allow this series of meetings to be of that work. Send your Holy Spirit, we ask, and your angels to abide with us now as we begin um, this series. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The premise of this particular study is that I believe that the 1843 chart, which you see here illustrated, which was present truth in the Millerite time period, is um, once again present truth here at the end of the world, although um, in a different aspect than it was in the pioneer time period. And from my understanding, Every representation on this chart, in a general sense, has light that we must understand here at the end of the world if we're going to understand Bible prophecy correctly. And I also believe that the 144,000 prophecy identifies that not only will the 144,000 have um, complete victory over sin, they'll have the experience that prophecy calls each man and woman to, but they will also have a full understanding of the prophetic message. So they will, they will have a grasp of the different um, truths that are represented on this 1843 chart. So some of the things that we're going to look at in this series is the daily, um, as, the, as represented on this chart, the daily in the book of Daniel. Um, we're going to consider the significance of the disintegration of the Roman Empire into ten kingdoms that uh, seven of those kingdoms ultimately plucked up three of those kingdoms to place the papacy on the throne of the earth. Um, the pioneers believed and illustrated on the chart that uh, the seven trumpets were the historical forces that brought down the Roman Empire, the first four trumpets bringing down the Roman Empire, the western part of the Roman Empire by uh, the fifth century, and the, the fifth and sixth trumpets, the first and second woes, were understood to be Islam, and uh, we believe that that is correct, and that understanding allows us the information to de define who and what is the third woe that's in history today. And you'll see here, the longest time prophecy in the Bible was understood by the Millerites as the 2520, and uh, we're going to deal with that as well. We're going to start with a few presentations on the daily, and I know that most of us here this afternoon are probably familiar with this particular um, presentation, but it needs to be in the record to prepare the way for some of the closing um, presentations in this series, so bear with me if it seems a bit redundant. Um, first three presentations are on the daily, and this first one is concerning the history of the daily. And I, I want to start, um, if you have your syllabus, page 2, um, early writings, page 74, 75. We're going to read this um, as we go through this presentation, brothers and sisters. Um, very few of us in Adventism, from my experience, know um, very much about the 2520. In fact, I'd say... Probably the majority of Seventh-day Adventists that in the last year and a half that I've met personally mentioned the 2522, and that would have to be in the hundreds by now, not the thousands, but the hundreds. The majority of them know nothing about it at all. And so, just to give you advance warning, we're going to look at that a little bit, the 2520, but the 2520, when you understand it as the pioneers did, and as we're going to apply it here at the end, it is directly connected to what Bible prophets called the scattering and the gathering. And I, I want to at least point that out to you before we deal with it, because notice how Sister White introduces um, the daily. I mean, this is a 
we're going to start with a statement on the daily from Sister White, but notice where she connects it to. September 23rd, the Lord showed me that he had stretched out his hand a second time to recover the remnant of his people and that efforts must be redoubled in this gathering time. In the scattering, Israel was smitten and torn. But now in the gathering time, God will heal up and bind his people. In the scattering, efforts made to spread the truth had but little effect, accomplished but little or nothing. But in the gathering, when God has set his hand to gather his people, efforts to spread the truth will have their designed effect. All should be united and zealous in the work. I saw that it was wrong for any to refer to the scattering, for examples, to govern us now in the gathering. For if God should do no more for us now than he did then, Israel would never be gathered. I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered, that the figures were as he wanted them, that his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed. Then I saw in relation to the daily that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom and does not belong to the text and that the Lord gave the correct view of it to those who gave the judgment hour cry. When union existed before 1844, nearly all, all were united on the correct view of the daily. But in the confusion since 1844, other views have been embraced, and darkness and confusion have followed. Time has not been a test since 1844, and it will never again be a test. Now, from my experience, most of us in Adventism are not familiar with the history of the subject of the daily in the book of Daniel. Daniel speaks of the daily in Daniel 8, Daniel 11, Daniel 12. Uh, most of us aren't too familiar with um, what that represents, but less familiar with the fact that what we teach the daily represents today in Adventism is directly opposite of what the pioneers taught. And then when we begin to look at the difference, if we do, we'll realize that there was a controversy over the daily that came into the Adventism in the 1901 time period and that for another 14 years Sister White was alive that she did comment on the controversy of the daily and it wasn't until 1931 until A.G. Daniels came out with a statement which we're going to look at here where he said basically that he believed Sister White endorsed his view of the daily um, and, I, and I reject his conclusion, and, and I think you'll, see, you'll at least see the logic why I reject it, whether you accept it or not. But the, those modern historians that suggest that A.G. Daniels' understanding of the daily was correct and that the pioneer understanding of the daily was incorrect, from my mind, they're not very um, careful in how they read this passage that we just read. I mean... Um, when she says that, uh, then I saw in relation to the daily that the word sacrifice was supplied by, human, by man's wisdom and does not belong to the text, and that the Lord gave the correct view of it to those who gave the judgment hour cry. You'll notice in your syllabus it says William Miller, Josiah Litt, Sylvester Bliss, Joseph Bates, J. N. Andrews, Hiram Edson, James White, Uriah Smith, Stephen Haskell, O. A. Johnson, J. G. Matson, F. C. Gilbert, and J. N. Lon Lofburl all believed the daily was paganism, and they pre preached it in their sermons and put it into their writings. Those were not all, but those are some of the most well-known names of the men that gave the judgment hour cry, and Sister White said the men that gave the judgment hour cry were correct on the subject of the daily, but the modern historians, they, they rest that statement and say that all she was saying in that statement is there'll be no more time prophecies. And if, you know, I'm not an English teacher, but I submit to you, if you took this to an English teacher, they would say you cannot draw that conclusion from this statement. All those, uh, nearly all were united on the correct view of the daily, and the correct view of it was given to those who gave the judgment hour cry. She's saying they were given the correct view. You go back, you look at what they believed. There's the correct view. That's my reasoning, but there is an argument in that. Now, in, we have dealt with, in our ministry, we have dealt with presentations on the daily. We have a, a, our standard presentations about four hours where we go through different components of it in a very detailed fashion, and I would refer that to the listeners that may watch this on 
DVD or hear it on audio cassette. If you want to take this to a, a, a more a deeper level than we're going to do here uh, this afternoon, the materials are available. I just want to place an overview in this particular series um, as we head towards the conclusion of this series. And in the bottom of the page where it says the modern historians, you will see the argument um, that allowed the Adventist church to begin teaching the view of the daily that it represented Christ's work in the sanctuary. Um, that view was a view in Adventism before William Miller, or was a view in the Protestant world before William Miller was raised up. The, the old Protestant view of what the daily represented before the time period of William Miller was that it represented the work of Christ in the sanctuary. That's the old view. But William Miller came to understand the daily as represented paganism in the book of Daniel. And from until 1901, that was the standard teaching in Adventism, is that the daily in the book of Daniel represented paganism. In 1901, when the, the old Protestant view was reintroduced, beginning with a man by name uh, Louis Conradi from Germany, when that view was reintroduced into Adventism in 1901, the context of Adventism called his view the new view. Conradi's view that the daily represents Christ's work in the sanctuary in Adventist history is called the new view, but in, really it's, in reality it's just the old Protestant view. The new view is William Miller's. William Miller introduced the new view on the daily. And it was one of the truths that William Miller discovered. But this next passage is a statement by A.G. Daniels where he is suggesting that he had an interview with Ellen White during the 1910 time period where she endorsed his view, his view being not paganism, Daniels' view, which he had inherited from Conradi, which Conradi had inherited from apostate Protestantism, was that the daily in the book of Daniel represents Christ's work in the sanctuary above. And we're going to put um, Daniel's statement in the record here, and then we're going to look at another witness to this subject. But he here's what uh, Daniel is saying, and this is found in Arthur White's book, on one of his um, books on Ellen White's volume 6. But at one point, a little later in the discussions, Elder Daniels, accompanied by W.C. White and C.C. Chrysler, eager to get from Ellen White herself just what the meaning was of her early writing statement, went to her and laid the matter before her. Daniels took with him early writings and the 1843 chart. He sat down close to Ellen White and plied her with questions. His report of this interview was confirmed by W.C. White. Now, now brothers and sisters, W.C. White, Ellen White's son confirms that Daniels had an interview with Ellen White on the daily in the 1910 time period. But in the records of the Ellen White estate, there is no record that he ever interviewed with Ellen White on the daily. Just keep that in the back of your mind because we're going to have some more to say about the Ellen White um, estate record keeping. So here's Daniels beginning what he said, his, his interview. I first read to Sister White the statement given above in early writings. Then I placed before her our prophetic chart used by our ministers in expounding the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. I called her attention to the picture of the sanctuary and also to the 2300-year period as they appeared on the chart. I then asked if she could recall what was shown her regarding this subject. As I recall her answer, she began telling how some of the leaders who had been in the 1844 movement endeavored to find new dates for the termination of the 2300-year period. This endeavor was to fix new dates for the coming of the Lord. The Lord w this was causing confusion among those who had been in the Advent movement. In this confusion, the Lord revealed to her, she said, that the view that had been held and presented regarding the dates was correct, and there, was, there must never be another time set nor another time message. Now, you just read. You just read her statement. And what he's suggesting here is that all she's saying in that statement is there's no more time setting. He's disregarding the fact that she says those who gave the judgment hour um, cry had the correct view of the daily. He's just walking right past that. Next page, he continues on. 
And notice, if you will, this next statement. We're going to deal with this. I, A.G. Daniels, I then asked her to tell what had been revealed to her about the rest of the daily, the prince, the host, the taking away of the daily, and the casting down of the sanctuary. In early writing 74, where we just read, she never said anything about that. I'm not suggesting that she had any insight on the prince, the host, uh, the taking away of the daily, or the casting down of the sanctuary. But the fact that she may at some point have said she had no light on this subject doesn't remove the statement she makes when she says, those who gave the judgment hour a cry had the correct view of the daily, period. That's what she said. It doesn't matter if, if she had any light on the prince, the host, the taking of the way of the daily, or the casting down of the sanctuary. What she was told about the daily is that William Miller had it right. Continuing on, she replied that these features were not placed before her in vision as the time part was. She would not be led out to make an explanation of those points of prophecy. The interview made a deep impression upon my mind. Without hesitation, she talked freely, clearly, and at length about the 2300-year period, but regarding the other part of the prophecy, she was silent. The only conclusion I could draw from her free explanation of the time and her silence as to taking away of the daily and the casting down of the sanctuary was that the vision given her was regarding the time and that she received no explanation as to the other parts of the prophecy. Well, I don't doubt that she, she may not have had any explanation of the other parts of the prophecy, but she did say that the men that gave the judgment hour cry were correct in their understanding of the daily. We read that. Now, <clears throat> this interview that W.C. White says that he remembers A.G. Daniels having in, with Ellen White, the interview supposedly took place in 1910, even though there is no recorded record of it in the White Estate. But during the time period when the argument was going on, F.C. Gilbert was a, a convert to Adventism he, from Judaism. He was a Hebrew scholar. I mean, it was his first language. He knew the Hebrew, and he was defending the pioneer position that the daily represented paganism from the Hebrew language against A.G. Daniels and Prescott. He was, he was there in that battle, and he says that he had an interview on the subject of the daily with Ellen White in 1910. And on his deathbed that same year, um, he recorded what the interview was about what he remembers about that interview. And you know what? If you go back to the White Estate and you look at the daily logbook of the people that interviewed Ellen White, sure enough, on the same date that he said he interviewed Ellen White on the daily, in the logbook, it says F.C. Gilbert was here and interviewed Ellen White on the daily. So the very year it happened, you have one person saying, I interviewed Ellen White on the daily. 21 years after 1910, and 16 years after Ellen White was laid to rest, so there's no way that she could confirm or deny the report, A.G. Daniels says he has an interview that has no, no reference in the White Estate logbook, and these two interviews are totally opposite. They're totally opposite. Here's what some of the things that F.C. Gilbert says about his interview. Now, why is it important to look at F.C. Gilbert's statements is this. There, no one, you don't hear this because the subject of the daily isn't discussed much except as it's taught the incorrect way in Adventism. But when the manuscript releases volumes came out in the 1970s, 1980s, there was entered a manuscript from 1910, this very year, where Sister White is talking about Daniel's view of the daily. And as you look at her statement from that very year, you'll see that she's saying the identical things that F.C. Gilbert's saying. If you took it into a court of law, to a non-Adventist that just looked at the, the validity of the witnesses and compared the, the, how, how supportable were the witnesses, there's no way that, that a, a jury would come down on A.G. Daniel's side. You'd have to come down on F.C. Gilbert's side. Here, here's what I mean. And this You see it, the page three. This is Gilbert's deathbed statement on this subject. Daniels and Prescott, and, it, and this isn't the whole thing, this is just parts of it, to try to emphasize some of what he was saying, how much it echoes what Sister White's going to say here in a moment. Daniels and Prescott would not give the older brethren in the cause any chance to say anything. Notice this. 
Gilbert says that as Sister White said, Daniel was, Daniels was here to see me and I would not see him. I would not have anything to say to him about anything, about the daily that they're trying to work up. There is nothing to it. When I was in Washington, there seemed to be something that just encased their minds. I could not seem to touch them. We are to have nothing to do with this subject of the daily. I knew they would work against my message, and then the people would not think there was anything to my message. I have written to him and told him that he was showing himself not to be the president of the General Conference, not the man to keep the presidency. If this message of the daily was, were a testing message, the Lord would have shown me these people do not see the end from the beginning in this thing. I utterly refuse to see any of them who are engaged in this work. The light was given me of God is that Brother Daniels has stood in the presidency long enough, and I was told not to have any more conversation with him about any of these things. Now, when, when Sister White says, I was told, who is telling her? God, an angel, is saying, do not do this. Now, this, this isn't Sister White. This is F.C. Gilbert as he remembered his interview. But she, he says, she said to him, I was told not to have any more conversation with him about any of these things. I would not see Daniels about the, the matter, and I would not have one word with him. They pled with me to give him an interview, but I would not have anything, I would not, I would not, him at all, any at all. I was told to warn our people not to have anything to do with this thing they are teaching. I was forbidden of the Lord to listen to it. I've expressed myself as having not a particular of confidence in it. This whole thing they are doing is a scheme of, a, of the devil. So what, where we're at at this point is this. We've read what Sister White said in early writings about the daily. And she says those people that gave the judgment hour cry were correct on the daily and they believed the daily was paganism. That was, the, that was the standard understanding until 1901 when Conradi, and who is Louis Conradi? He's perhaps one of, if not the most, famous apostate in the history of Adventism. He is the man that pretty much single-handedly destroyed the confidence of the spirit of prophecy to the brethren in Germany, or, or, or Europe, not Germany, Europe to this very day. And he introduced this false view of the daily it was taken up by Daniels and Prescott, and they began to agitate the subject. Sister White had many things to say about the controversy that then raged over whether the pioneer position was correct or this new view was correct. She, she was dealing with the shaking that it was causing within the church, not so much with any of the theological analysis of the daily, but she wrote things about whether we should be presenting the daily or arguing about the daily. And... 21 years, 16 years after her death, Daniels says that he had an interview where Sister basically endorses his position, yet one of the men that was opposing Daniels had an interview with Sister White that's confirmed, and he says the opposite thing as Daniel, and then in the 1970s, 1980s, when manuscript releases came out, Sister White makes her statements about the daily, and brothers and sisters, It'll be hard to probably go back and forth in your mind to what F.C. Gilbert stated, what we just read, and this passage that we're going to read. But if you take the time, you have the notes, you go back and you'll see that what F.C. Gilbert was stating is what Sister White is stating. In other words, she's agreeing with F.C. Gilbert's testimony of the interview. Now on page four, it says, Errors and dangers of Prescott and Daniels, the cities to be worked. This is from manuscript releases. It's volume, uh, volume 20, pages 17 through 22. And you'll notice this first little paragraph. This is from the editors, the people that compiled manuscript releases. This is what they say. A.G. Daniels was elected president of the General Conference in 1901. This suggests that this document was written in 1910. This is the year that Daniel said he had the interview with Sister White, and this is the year that F.C. Gilbert did have his interview with Ellen White. And this is what she says. At this stage of our experience, we are not to have our minds drawn away from the special light given us to consider at the important gathering of our conference. And there was Brother Daniels, whose mind the enemy was working. In the culture of Christianity, in the, in the culture of Adventism. 
what does it mean that the enemy is working someone's mind? Satan is influencing their mind, right? And there was Brother Daniels, whose mind the enemy was working, and your mind and Elder Prescott's mind were being worked by the angels that were expelled from heaven. Satan's work was to divert your minds that jots and tittles should be brought in, which the Lord did not inspire you to bring in. They were not essential, but this meant much to the cause of truth. And the ideas of your minds, if you could be drawn away to the jots and tittles, is a work of Satan's devising. To correct little things in books written, you suppose would be doing a great work, but I am charged, silence is golden. Brothers and sisters, as we go through these presentations, we're going to read you a quote where Sister White says that the book, Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, written by Uriah Smith, is God's helping hand. And in the book, which Sister White calls God's helping hand, Uriah Smith fully and completely upholds the pioneer position on the daily, and Daniels and Prescott wanted to go back into those books and change those statements about the daily to meet their ideas on the daily. So part of what Sister White's talking about in this passage is that you don't need to go in and change those books because those books are sound anyway. To correct little things in the books written, you suppose would be doing a great work, but I'm charged silence is eloquence. I am to say, stop picking your flaws. If this purpose of the devil could only be carried out, then it appears to you that your work would be considered as most wonderful in conception. If the, it was the enemy's plan to get all the supposed object, objectionable features where all classes of mind did not agree, and what then? The very work that pleases the devil would come to pass. Drop down to the last paragraph on this page, and I'm leaving some out just because of time. And she says, And I was shown from the first that the Lord had given neither elders, Daniel, or, nor Prescott the burden of this work. Now notice how she summarizes the burden of this work that elders, Daniel, and Prescott had. Should Satan's wiles be brought in, should this daily be such a great matter as to be brought in to confuse minds and hinder the advancement of the work at this important period of time, it should not, whatever may be, this subject, subject should not be introduced. Now, brothers and sisters, there's more to read in her statement. But right here, in these first four paragraphs, Sister White says that Daniel's mind in 1910 was being worked by angels that expelled, were expelled from heaven and that, there, that it was Satan's wiles, his ideas of the daily were Satan's wiles and they should not be introduced at this time. Yet 16 years after Ellen White died, Daniel said that very year he had an interview with, with Sister White and all he could conclude is that she endorsed his position on the daily where at the, state, the very year that she was writing this, F.C. Gilbert said that he had a, an interview on the Daily with Sister White, which is recorded in the White Estate, and he, he agrees that what Sister White was saying about da Prescott's and Daniel's view of the Daily, that she told him it came from the devil. Now, flip over to the next, the next page, second paragraph down. Out of, you have the whole manuscript that you can look at in your own leisure. Second paragraph begins with now. Now when I saw how you were working, my mind took in the whole situation and the results if you should go forward and give the parties that, I, that have left us the least chance to bring confusion in our, into our ranks. Your lack of wisdom would be just what Satan would have it. Your loud proclamation was not under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What's his loud proclamation? We read it in a previous paragraph. He made a loud proclamation, lifting up his position of the daily in a meeting, and she was saying his position of the daily was not under the inspiration of God. That's, just read it on your own leisure. I'm not twisting these words. Um, I was instructed to say to you that your picking flaws in the writings of men that have been led of God is not inspired of God. 
And, and if this is the wisdom that Elder Daniels would give to the people, by no means give him an official position, for he cannot reason for cause to effect. Go back to F.C. Gilbert's statement, and, and you'll see that he was told by Ellen White, according to F.C. Gilbert, he was told that Daniels and Prescott can't reason from cause to effect, and that Daniels shouldn't be the president of the General Conference any longer. That's just what she's saying here. The same concepts, the same conclusion. Now you notice... In modern Adventism, one of the arguments on the, even discussing the subject of the daily is there's so often, for Sister White, when discussing the subject of the daily, she's saying, silence is eloquence. You go back and you read all the statements that Sister White says on the daily, and you'll find that when she's making statements at that, like that, it's, it's from this perspective. And we're in the second paragraph, right in the middle, where right after where it says, for he cannot reason from cause to effect, she says, your silence on this subject is your wisdom. If you look at the context of the statements, when Sister White is addressing the daily, the controversy of the daily that took place from 1901 to 1950, 15, she many times says, make statements like, your silence is eloquent. Silence on this subject is your elegance. In context, what she's saying is she's speaking to Prescott and Daniels, the people that were p p pushing the position from the devil, and she's saying, your wisdom is to keep your mouth shut on this subject. That was the specific counsel she was giving, but that specific counsel to Daniels and Prescott was the general counsel to all of Adv Adventism, because at that time period, they were the minority. So Sister White, as the prophet, was looking to the people that were agitating the error and saying, you need to keep quiet. But then at the, to the church at large, she was saying, you need to keep quiet on this subject too. We don't need to keep discussing this subject. Let's drop this subject and let the minority position disappear. So she was given prophetic counsel. And therefore, when you hear at the end of the world and the modern theologians say, ah, you should not be discussing the daily because Sister White says silence on this subject is eloquence. Look very carefully. She's not, she's not giving that type of counsel. She's giving counsel to try to control a shaking, a controversy that was in the church at this time. And we're going to show you that it, that doesn't apply here at the end of the world. We're going to show you that hopefully before we get through with this presentation. So there's more to say from this, but turn to page six of your syllabus. Top of the page, I have been instructed that such hasty movements should not have been made such as selecting you, A.G. Daniels, as president of the conference even another year. That's just what F.C. Gilbert said. But the Lord forbid any more such hasty transactions until the matter is brought before the Lord in prayer and you have had the message come to you that the work of the Lord resting upon the president is a most solemn responsibility, you had no moral right to blaze out as you did on the subject of the daily and suppose your influence would decide the question. There was Elder Haskell, who was on the right side of the subject of the daily. There was Elder Haskell, who had carried heavy responsibilities. Elder Haskell, at that time, is an old man, Daniel's fairly young man in relation to Elder Haskell. There was Elder Haskell, who, who has carried the heavy responsibility, and there is Elder Irwin and several men I might mention who have the heavy responsibility. Where is your respect for the men of age? What authority could you exercise without taking all the responsible men to weigh the matter? But let us now investigate the matter. We must now reconsider whether it is the Lord's judgment in the face of the work that has been neglected of showing your zeal to carry the work even another year. If you should carry the work another year and with the help that shall unite with you, there should be a change take place in you and Elder Prescott and humble your hearts before God. The Lord will have to see in you a showing of a different experience for if ever men needed to be reconverted at this present time. It is Elder Daniels and Elder Prescott. At what time? In 1910, the same time that Daniels said he was interviewing Ellen White and she was endorsing his position of the daily, which she says in this passage came from the devil. Two paragraphs down. Christ is not dead. He will never suffer his work to be carried on in this strange way. Let the books alone. If any change is essential, 
And she's speaking about the book by Uriah Smith, which upholds the pioneer position on the daily. If any change is essential, God will have the harmony and that change consistent. But when a message has been entrusted to men with large responsibilities involved, God demands faithfulness that will work by love and purify the souls. Elder Daniels and Prescott both need reconversion. A strange work has come in, and it is not in harmony with the work that Christ came to our world to do. And all who are truly converted will work the works of Christ. Last paragraph on page 7. Last paragraph of the passage that begins, Yes, it would. Yes, it would, but while their minds were thus absorbed, I was shown that brothers Daniel and brother Prescott were weaving into their experience sentiments of a spiritualistic appearance and drawing our people to beautiful sentiments that would deceive, if possible, the very elect. Now, brothers and sisters, please notice, she's talking about this, the, the wrong view of the daily, and she, there's some way, somehow, that she was shown that the incorrect view of the daily would deceive, if possible, the very elect. Is it, this isn't a minor error. This is part of uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that those people that don't receive a love of the truth are going to receive strong delusion. But we have more to say about that as we go on. But I wanted to make note of it that Sister White is inferring that right here. I have to trace with my pen the fact that these brethren would see defects in their, would see defects in their delusive ideas that would place the truth in uncertainty, and yet they would stand out as if they had great spiritual discernment. Now I am to tell them that when I was shown this matter, when Elder Daniels was lifting up his voice like a trumpet in advocating his ideas of the daily, the after results were presented. Our people were becoming confused. 1 Corinthians 14.32 says, The spirits of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. And what's the next verse say? But God isn't the author of confusion. So if their ideas of the daily, if she was shown that their ideas of the daily would bring about confusion. Who's the author of the daily, as Daniels and Prescott understood it? It's not the Lord. Our people were becoming confused. I saw the result, and then there were given me cautions that if Elder Daniels, without respect to the outcome, should thus be impressed and let himself believe he was under the inspiration of God, skepticism would be sown among our ranks everywhere, and we should be where Satan would carry his messages. Set unbelief and skepticism, skepticism would be sown in human minds and a strange crop of evil would take the place of truth. I submit to you that's where we're at, the Seventh-day Adventist at the end of the world. In the final quarter of 2004, our Sabbath school lessons dealt with the daily in the book of Daniel and they taught the daily in the book of Daniel just as Daniels and Prescott presented it. Now, select the messages, book one, page 57, says this. Regarding the testimonies, nothing is ignored, nothing is cast aside, but time and place must be considered. There are passages, we all know this probably, where Sister White points out that it's sin to own a bicycle. Is it sin to own a bicycle today? Not necessarily, probably for some people it would be, but... There's many people in third world countries that are, are carrying out their missionary endeavors on bicycles. But when she said that it was a sin to own a bicycle, it would be a month or two wages to buy a bicycle, and it was simply because it was a fashion statement. Sister White's statement, she says here plainly, time and circumstances must be concerned, considered. And in Christ Object Lessons 127, in every age, there is a development of truth, a message of God to the people of that generation. Is there going to be a, a present truth message for the people of God at the very end of time? In every age, there is one, but certainly at the end of time, we can plan on one. There's going to be a present truth message at the end of the world. The old truths are essential. New truth is not independent of the old, but an unfolding of it. It is only as the, truths, the old truths are understood that we can comprehend the new. We ought to, as Seventh-day Adventists, we need to read that last sentence until we have it memorized. It is only as the old truths are understood that we can comprehend the new. And yet today, we virtually know nothing of the foundational truths that are established by the pioneers, the men of God's choosing, but it's only as we understand those truths that we can comprehend the new. That's what she's saying here. 
When Christ desired to open to his disciples the truth of his resurrection, he began at Moses and all the prophets and expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. But it is the light which shines in the fresh unfolding of truth that glorifies the old. Who re he who rejects or neglects the new does not really possess the old. For him it loses its vital power and becomes but a lifeless form. Now, if you that, those last two sentences, the first one of the last two, that's a profound statement, even though it's real, real simple. If new light comes to God's people, and Sister White's plain. Some people are led to believe that we're not to be looking for new light, and Sister White says we're supposed to be searching for new light as a miner digs for treasures. We're supposed to be looking for new light because that's what prophecy, the promise of prophecy is, is that prophecy continues to unfold at the end of the world, getting brighter and brighter as we approach the return of the Lord. But she says, there, we're taught there will be some people that will not receive new light. And why won't they receive it? He who rejects or neglects the new, the new light, does not really possess the old. You cannot understand new light if you don't understand the foundations. And that goes along with uh, the earlier sentence in the paragraph, which said, it is only as the old truths are understood that we can comprehend the new. We have to understand the foundational understandings of Adventism and brothers and sisters, that's what one of the things that we're trying to establish here. The foundational understandings of Adventism are illustrated on this chart, which Sister White says was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered. And I've now stood before hundreds of Seventh-day Adventists and mentioned this chart, and there is a big percentage of us that do not even know what, that there was a chart or what I'm speaking about, after the meeting, they'll have to come and say, what chart are you speaking about? And I says, well, it's mentioned in early writing 74, and they'll say, some, sometimes they'll say, well, yeah, I read that. I didn't know what that, that meant. But brothers and sisters, this chart here is a divine, this is ordained by the Lord, Sister White said so. We read that in the opening statement. This is a divine representation of the foundational truths of Adventism. We should understand this chart. We should, but by and large, we don't. So what I'm suggesting is, is in Manuscript Releases, next quote, Manuscript Releases, number 13, page 394, Sister White says this, We have not, no time to lose. Troublous times are before us. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. The prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that's taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. So what's she speaking about here? Now, I had an interaction on Daniel 11 with uh, Gerhard Fandel, who's one of the um, members of the Biblical Research Institute here in the recent past. He critiqued the Time of the End magazine, which we put out and covers, which covers the last six verses of Daniel 11, and then we responded to his critique, and he responded to our response, and then we responded to his response, and that was the end of it. But on this particular passage here, I suggested that this is one of the most important passages to understand Daniel 11, and uh, Elder Fandel's position of this is that when Sister White is speaking here in this passage that we're reading, that this, doesn't have, this isn't dealing with Daniel 11. This is about Revelation 13. So let me read this last couple sentences one more time. The prophecy of the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that's taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. Is she speaking about Daniel 11 or Revelation 13? This is Daniel 11. She says, in the 30th verse, a power is spoken of that shall be grieved. And then she quotes verses 30 to 36 of Daniel 11. And as soon as she's done quoting verses 30 to 36 of Daniel 11, she says, scenes similar to those described in these words will take place place. Sister White is speaking, she first places the context of this passage in the future fulfillment of Daniel 11. The next sentence, she says, much of the history that's taken place in Daniel 11 will be repeated when Daniel 11 finally is fulfilled. And then she specifically points to verses 30 to 36 and says the history that's represented in verses 30 to 36 of Daniel 11, scenes similar to those described in these verses, will be repeated when Daniel 11 comes to pass, is fulfilled. So, what does that have to do with our subject at hand? Well, what it has to do with our subject at hand is in verse 31 of Daniel 11, if 
you'll turn there with me. Verse 31 of Daniel 11 includes the daily. Verse 31, which is one of the histories that Sister White says is going to be repeated when Daniel 11 is fulfilled. Verse 31 of Daniel 11 says, An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice. Sister White had much to say, or at least a little to say, about the controversy of the daily that went on in her lifetime from 1901 to 1915. But in that time period, the final verses of Daniel 11 had not began to unfold. Daniel 11, verse 40, is describing the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989. But what Sister White did say was that when these verses in Daniel 11, verses 40 and onward, when they are finally reaching the time period when they're going to be fulfilled, the history of verses 30 to 36 of Daniel 11 is a pattern for that future history when it unfolds. And therefore, the fact that the daily is part of this history, suddenly the subject of the daily has a present truth component that it did not have in 1901 to 1915. It just wasn't there, and that's what we're suggesting when it comes to the testimonies. Time and circumstances are to be considered. In every age, there is a new development of present truth, and the subject of the day that means more for us here at the end of the world when the last six verses of Daniel 11 are beginning to unfold than it did back there when Daniels and Prescott were pushing the idea that the daily represented the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, in conservative Adventism, generally, you find a fair amount of people in conservative Adventism that try to uphold the pioneer position of the daily, but you find some that are unwilling to separate themselves from the standard position that is taught in Adventism today by the modern theologians. And one of the arguments is this. Brother, you shouldn't be talking about the, the daily because Sister White says we're not supposed to talk about the daily. Uh, you had someone in your church just a few weeks ago that brought that argument up. That's a common argument. Let's look at some of the places where, where we will address that argument. Notebook leaflet number two, page 161. This is not a time to make prominent, unimportant points of, of difference. All these passages, by the way, are about the daily. And what, is, what did she say in that first sentence? This is not the time. If some who have had a strong living connection with the master reveal to the world their weakness of Christian experience, the enemies of truth who are watching us closely will make the most of it and our work will be hindered. Let all cultivate, cultivate meekness and learn lessons from him who is meek and lowly in heart. The subject of the daily should not call for such movements as have been made. As a result of the way this subject has been handled by men on both sides of the question, controversy has arisen and confusion has resulted. While the present condition of difference of opinion regarding this subject, the daily, exists, let it not be made prominent. Let all contention cease. At such a time, silence is eloquence. Brothers and sisters, when she made this statement, it was by far not even... It was, it was such a minority that it's almost immeasurable. It was a minority of people that were pushing the false view of the daily against the majority of the Adventist church. It's a different time today. Today, the majority of the Adventist church doesn't have a position one way or another on the daily. We've been walking along in our Laodicean condition and we no longer understand anything about prophecy, basically. And then there is a group of us who think that we understand something about the daily, and among that group, it's divided into two classes, and by far, the majority of people that think they have a position on the daily, they have the position that Sister White said came from the devil, devil that the daily represents the work of Christ in the sanctuary above. And one of the arguments that prevents people from clarifying this truth is that Sister White says, we're not supposed to discuss the daily, but you look at when she's saying, the, and she consistently says, this is not the time. At such a time, while the present condition exists, she wasn't saying we should never discuss the daily. She's saying, right now when I'm writing this, it applies. But the fact that she over and over again says, at such a time, when this present condition exists, tells you that there will come a time when it needs to be addressed. Or she would have said, we should never 
discuss the daily. She never says that. Next quote. I have words to speak to my brethren east and west, north and south. I request that my writing shall not be used as the leading argument to settle questions over which there is now so much controversy. Brothers and sisters, I'm using a little bit of her, of her writings here in this first presentation, but we're going to defend the pioneer position of the daily from the Bible. Okay? I entreat of elders H.I.J. and others of our leading brethren that they make no reference to my writing to sustain their views of the daily. It has been presented to me that this is not the subject of vital importance. I am instructed to our brethren that our brethren are making a mistake in magnifying the importance of the difference in the views that are held. I cannot consent that any of my writings shall be taken as settling this matter. The true meaning of the daily is not to be made a test question. I, am no I now ask my ministering brethren that my ministering brethren shall make no shall not make use of my writings in their arguments regarding this question, for I have no instruction on the point under discussion, and I see no need for controversy. Regarding this matter under present conditions, silence is eloquence. She qualifies it every time. That Selective Message is book one. In the next paragraph, um, she qualifies it again and saying, at this time. The next manuscript releases, volume 12, page 224. It will prove to be a great mistake if you agitate at this time the question regarding the daily, which has been occupying much of your tension of late. Next passage from manuscript releases, volume 9, page 106, says, I have had cautions given me reg in regard to the necessity of keeping a united front. This is a matter of importance to us at this time. As individuals, we need to act with the greatest caution. I wrote to Blank telling him that he must be exceedingly careful not to introduce subjects in the review that would seem to point out flaws in our past experience. I told him that this matter on which he believes, is a, believes a mistake has been made is not a vile question, and that should it be given prominence now, our enemies would take advantage of it and make a mountain out of a molehill. To you also I say that this subject of the daily should not be agitated ever. Is that what she says? At this time. And I guarantee if you talk about the daily, you're going to get this is one of the main arguments. Sister White says over and over again, we're not supposed to agitate the subject of the daily, period. That's how it's presented to you. And then many people go back and read those passages, and that's what they see. They, they, for some reason, they don't see this, these qualifying statements, and they're always there at this time. So, um, and page 10, bringing this to a conclusion, um, from, from the quote out of Elmshaven Years by Arthur White, which we've already read, and I already emphasized it. Daniel says that when he interviewed Sister White, and you can see it here again, that she had nothing to say about um, the rest of the daily, which he identifies as the prince, the host, the taking away of the daily, and the casting down of the sanctuary. And I don't know of any statements in the spirit of prophecy where Sister White has anything to say about the prince or the host or the casting down of the sanctuary. But what I do know is the quote that we started with. Sister White says, those men who gave the judgment our cry were correct in their understanding of the daily. And those men taught that the daily was paganism. And here it is at early writing 74. Then I saw in relation to the daily that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom and does not belong to the text and that the Lord gave the correct view of it to those who gave the judgment our cry. The men that put this chart together are the men that gave the judgment our cry and they have an understanding illustrated on this chart that corresponds with the year that paganism was removed in history for, as the legal profession of the seven European kings. And that was their understanding. That's what they taught. And if they were going to teach everything they understood about every symbol on here, then this chart would have to be as big as this backstage back here. This is a very simplified illustration of the understanding of the pioneers. But if you go into their writings, they have page after page identifying their positions on these different subjects. And right here in 508 on this chart, they believe that paganism had been removed from the seven European kings and replaced with Catholicism. That's the teaching of the pioneers that Sister White says was pretty much unanimous and that they were correct upon. Shall we pray?
Heavenly Father, as we approach the subject of the daily, we understand that it is a subject that has been controversial for over a hundred years in Adventism, and that there are statements and inspiration that can lead you to believe that it's a subject that um, we're not supposed to even discuss, but it's clear that you have left recorded in the writings of your servant and in the Bible the information that the daily here at the end of the world has a different significance than it did in the beginning of Adventism. It's now a, a component of present truth, and it's your men and women that you have called to finish the work here at the end of the world. We need to have every piece of light on these um, subjects that is uh, necessary and available, and we ask that you would open our minds to see the significance of this subject as it relates to end-time events, and we thank you for answering our prayers in advance. In Jesus' name, 